thank you so much, Stephen, for being here today. I'm very excited to share your expertise and insights with the audience. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here as well, Michelle. Thank you for inviting me along. It is a journey, this education revolution. It's a journey, and you've been on it for a long time. And what I love about your perspective, um, so many things, but you have had worn lots of different hats over the years in the education industry and also in various sectors, like various components of the sector. So private language education, college, public college education, public university level education. So it's gonna be really great to get your insights around some, some themes that we tend to talk a lot about on this podcast, um, like technology and innovation, but based on all those different hats that you've worn over the years. That would be marvelous, yeah, just fire away. Let's see where we go. So I always start with going backwards, Stephen. So those of us who have chosen education as a career, I always think it's fascinating um, the in, the um, your beginnings of education. So I, I don't mean to out you. I'm not going to say your specific age, but you did go to elementary school in like the 70s, 80s, <laughs> elementary, secondary school in the 70s and 80s. You, I think people will be able to tell already, maybe by your accent, it wasn't in Canada. Um, so tell us a little bit about some of those first experiences you had in education in the system at that time and, and where you grew up, like, did you always like school? Was it something you you enjoyed when you were young, like really young, like grade one, two, three? Do you remember like enjoying going to school or could you not wait for summer break? Um, I enjoyed, right. This is a great question. So I've got an anecdote and I'll tell you what I think as well. So maybe the two will describe different things, but um, I see, I think I remember enjoying going to school when I was quite young, but it was more like a, partly a social experience. And I think that was true of all of my K to 12 experience. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed that part of it. Um, and some parts of the learning specifically, I, um, I very much loved English, history, geography. They were really, really subjects I absolutely loved. But in terms of actually being in the class and being a like a, student, a learner, I remember one of my teachers, and I was probably about eight or at most nine, they um, they looked at me one day in class and just called me out and said, Stephen, don't worry so much. <laughs> I must have had like some kind of worried look on my face about perhaps processing something, and it could well have been nothing to do with the material at hand. It could have been I was daydreaming because I was a daydreamer as well. That's the other truth of the matter. Um, but I, you know, went through school and everything, finished high school and so forth. But I did terrible at school. I had no real academic kind of interests that so, so much. So I kind of went back to um, complete higher education after traveling around for a couple of years around the Middle East. It's true, you did. There was a pause there. Let's take a moment to just talk more about these elementary, secondary experiences. I love this social element because I have heard stories from you as well where um, I think, you know, school age Stephen was skiving off during the afternoon and enjoying walks in the hills um, and experiences with friends in the countryside of fair England um, where you went to school. Uh, so I definitely want to I want to double click on this like social element, because I know that that's something that's really resurging in teaching and learning, like this idea of the intricate, like the intri in inextricably social nature of learning. Some call it relational pedagogy. There's lots of social emotional learning. There's lots of taglines for it. But you could feel even from a very young age that school was a community event, that it was going to a community, that it, that was a critical component of what it meant to go to school. There's no question about it. It was, it was, the, it was your social circle. So, I mean, particularly in a smaller town, in the suburb of a smaller town in Northern England, that everybody who you were in your class with, they were your friends outside of class and you'd see them all the time, right? And that I think is equally true of the parents as well. They were their friends. And I even know my own mother, her, her kind of friend circle, it, are still the mothers of me and my friends when we went to school like many, many years ago. So the social aspect is a community thing. It's not just for the for the kids in the school, it's for the parents as well. And I think it's an extremely big deal. And I think that that social element, that protection and that warmth of that social element is um, essential for, well, I suppose like, it has definitely effect on the cognitive development. You comfort in that environment, that it's not an alien environment for you. And um, 
that it, it's it's just sort of seen as the normal thing to do is that it, it is a socialization experience going to school as well right there's no question about it but i feel like we're losing some of that like i feel like there was even in the primary junior there's this uh there was a pre there was another uh, guest I was speaking to on the podcast who talks about the massification of education. And she's re- she was referring to it in terms of like large enrollment first year courses in university. But I would argue even now in a lot of the, I mean, we live in Toronto, which is a Toronto District School Board, which is the largest school board in Canada. I'm going to say that and then someone's going to Google it and say that that's not true. But one of the largest school boards in Canada and class sizes, you know, the the idea that Now a kindergarten class could have 30, 35, 40 students in it. And then you're getting all of these classes, grade one, two splits where, you know, there's half of half the class is grade one, half the class is grade two. And the, and these classes are not small. There, there is, yes, you grew up in a small town. I grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia. I didn't, I had, you know, 20, 30 students in my, in my class. But there is, do you feel even at the early stages, before we even get to the higher education sectors that we work in, like even in these primary junior levels of education, there's this kind of, and I don't mean to romanticize it because it's not like I'm trying to paint this picture of the red barn and the cows in the field. And, you know, like we were this idyllic kind of uh, society, but something has been eroded. Is that fair to say? Or how are you experiencing that? How are you experiencing the evolution from what you had as a child to what you see children in in school systems experiencing now? So, um, I think it go I, right. I think I mean school changes and the relationship that society has with schooling changes when society changes and the different pressures on society at different times. So what was true for me in the 1980s is no longer true in the 20 20 20s, right? Um I think for example one of the major changes is it's a bit more of a commodification of education now than it used than it was when I was at school so it was really there was only a couple of large exams that uh, me and my school buddies would have to do in in all the way through the education there was one at the age of about 10 or 11 which streamed you into different uh, areas or there was and there was one at 16 and then one a big one at 18 as well in the UK but what happened and that, that was true and that's equally still true now but i think what happened and maybe has happened is is the case in Canada as well, is that a lot of things are preparing towards an end goal, not in and of, you're not living within the moment. So we're not like this necessarily present in our environment to learn, because I think there's pressures on instructors and teachers to, to succeed to certain benchmarks along the way. And we have like, we're all so individual um, that benchmarks are kind of somehow arbitrary anyway, and um, so that benchmarks are for an external audience, but they have an effect on the internal learner as well. And, and that leads to perceptions of success. And so, I mean, my background is a lot of international education, more at the adult education side. But if you look at K to 12 as well, and you have in, people coming to Canada, immigrants to Canada and having to dive into, into the K to 12 system. Imagine what it's like for them, that transfer and the feeling of success, the feeling of belonging for them and what that looks like. It could be detrimental to them needlessly if they're being benchmarked consistently. Yeah, absolutely. And this is fascinating because this is also something that that comes out early on when I talk about, um, I guess, like yourselves, background with education, because what were the success benchmarks for you going to school? Like when you say, I went, it was social. I didn't do great, but I did like, it wasn't like my grades weren't necessarily the best, but I went through school and I, you know, had had the experience. What was the narrative in your household in terms of what success was? Like, was like when I grew up, because I grew up with immigrant parents who had this extreme focus on education, in my house, it, the thing we heard, the messaging we got about what school was is, I have a job. I go to work. School is your job. I go to work. You go to school. So you're going to do the, you're going to do the work. You, they never were obsessive about getting A's. They, they didn't want you to get D's or F's, but if you were in the middle, that was all that mattered. And you know, you were, you were doing your job and they were doing their job. So, but there was this also explicit connection made between school and financial well-being in our, in our, my house as well because of the immigrant background. So being successful was you went, you tried your best, you did your job. 
And that by doing your job, you will in some way have access to more career opportunities that will be more lucrative so you can be financially independent. Like there was a, it is for, it is ultimately for work that we go to school because it is beneficial to have a degree and you'll get a better job and you'll have a better um, financial outlook. What was the messaging you heard in your house in terms of what school was for? Like what was the value proposition laid out for you about, about school and thus what success looked like? I mean, certainly I think it was similar in the fact that um school was our job you know and then going to it uh, was what we were supposed to be doing whereas my parents were both busy working but I think that connection between career afterwards and um I think that goes back to my commodification comp- com- comment a little bit because in the 80s in England it was pretty pretty bad the economy back then that's a lot worse than it is now um for example And even now the economy is not great, but it was much worse in the early 80s. So education at that time was still not tightly connected to the workforce necessarily. That happened when you went to college or university or you went into an apprenticeship after school. So you kind of finished school and you could have these different options. The other thing is back then, only about 25% of the population went to university. So Mm. university was an elite thing, not for most people. Mm-hmm. Most people you were guided to like get a job in your local town, right? So that connection between mm. Asian and, and um, um, development of your career and development of society was just not made back then. It was more about learning. The focus was on, you know, we did we read endless Shakespeare and things like that, and you know, there's not that much. I think there's a great value to knowing that stuff in the humanities. I think that I think we should do many more of them. And I think for civics reasons, it's important. But those things have gone by the way a little bit because people have commodified education to a means to an end. Now, it can be both, right? So it is a means to an end, but you can't throw out that other part mm. for the sake of learning, um, and in a way to improve all of ourselves for the betterment of a larger society. Well, this is another question around skills, because I do want to make this connection between um, this really, I, I, you might argue, overemphasis, but now moving towards these employability skills, workplace readiness skills, future-proofing skills, all these things which are now such a uh, commodity in the yeah. higher education value proposition, Uh, There is also this really interesting evolution happening, I think, in the teaching and learning sector that's also emphasizing. So, yes, this increased level of commodification of education and connection to the workforce has led to, however you want to qualify it, a strong emphasis, an overemphasis on these workplace-related skills. But also there's this really interesting resurgence, I think, of human skills and the idea that in an age of automation, almost we need to revisit these models of the early 70s, 80s, 60s education, 70s, 80s, that were much more about, you know, being kind or how how you interact with each other or human elements of communication, collaboration, creativity. Back when music and art was not something that would ever have gotten cut from a primary education, there's this resurgence of those types of skills as well. Um, and would would you say those were skills that were emphasized for you and that you can see now being again kind of brought back into the fold? Like we kind of moved away from them um to these hard then this this evolution towards the hard sciences or hard facts. And now um because so many arts programs ha- have gone by the wayside, now everyone's realizing that, oh, we need to be paying attention to these kinds of skills too. Yeah. I mean, I will say that in Toronto, there are some great schools that focus on the arts as well. And you can you can apply to go to those into high school. So definitely this is happening. Now, what going back to your comment about workplace communication and workplace skills, we know that a lot of organizations and businesses say, hey, we need your gra- we need university graduates to have um these kind of soft skills, as they were called a, a, a while back. But they're about communication, critical thinking, problem solving, problem modeling, teamwork. All of the term workplace communications really is a secret way of saying, hey, you really need to focus a bit more on the humanity side of studying, because that's where you can grasp those kind of things. So if you're doing a play, 
with your peers in your high school that's collab total collaboration if you're doing music and you're playing in a band through school that's collaboration right problem solving problem modeling there's you know ex certain types of exercises project based learning is about that um so that's how i think that what people are asking for now is disguising the fact that what really mm. is more of this kind of people need to not do not not do through humanities so you've got that t-shaped model which is breadth and depth in edu in learning right as well yeah and i think uh how do you feel about my argumentation around this and doing this work in systems change yeah. is that any course can teach to your point so you're talking about the t-shaped skills how you have those transdisciplinary skills and then you can have domain specific skills that can go in depth into a content area I truly believe that these skills, these human skills, soft skills, I tend to call them human skills, process skills, the ones that you've mentioned, I believe that it's so much about how you teach, not what you teach, right? So to your point, problem-based learning, inquiry-based learning, relational pedagogy, a variety of assessment methods would fit in this category as well. How we teach can develop some of these human skills and then it's interesting to see the evolution of what we teach. Now you operate in the current, in your current uh, role in the field of continuing studies. So I'd be curious to know your thoughts on the what, because, and the how, obviously um, I've spoken with a lot of uh, instructor support staff over the years, and there is a real, this, let's do this shift first. Yeah, let's do the, the human skills shift first. Getting instructors to grasp the idea that it doesn't matter what they're teaching, they could be teaching in a methodology or with a, a philosophy or in the spirit of a certain a certain transdisciplinary mindset that could help capacity build their students in some of these human skills. How do you work with instructors in your current role or in previous roles where you've supported instructors in this way to grasp that idea and not only appreciate it, but implement it to a certain degree? Because it is it is obviously with academic freedom being a word we hear a lot in in the higher ed sector it's not something we can mandate necessarily people take on so that's a great question and i'm in my current role i am an administrator so i have to grapple with these kind of questions um as do my colleagues across the in institution i think um Okay, one of the things I know that you're interested in is technology, for example, and innovation in technology. So let's take that as a sort of a line of thought for this. When people think of innovation in education at the moment, they usually think of um, innovation in, oh, a new app has come out. Let's employ that in the class. Let, or a new platform has come out. How can we employ this and use this to support the learning going on, for example? Um, I think those are valid, those are important, but I think for many instructors, they're just the framework around which that they think and prepare and do what they do, their, their skill uh, day in, day out, and, and the consistency of doing that as well. I think one area of innovation that's often is secondary, it, I think it's more important, but it's often not considered immediately, is almost the no tech option. So if you think about no tech, it could be a couple of different things. That could mean how you go about the instruction in the classroom, which is methodology in a sense. So methodology is a technology, right? So but how do you go about? So I think training, giving lots of professional development and providing opportunities for people to understand that there's more than one way to go about an instructional moment and to prepare that, whether it's in a two hour class or a cross four to eight weeks or a term even what different things can you be doing to mix things up another no tech option i think is the way that you structure the actual um framework of institutions in how they operationalize the instruction so we're, fol we're following the same kind of model that we've used for a really long time in in undergraduate education like you referred to earlier have large first year classes so forth for uh, with credit hours and so forth that model it's very efficient in what it does and it's again a neat way of kind of organizing it on a mass scale 
I think innovation there would not be system wide. I think it would be micro. And it's how that individual instructor would decide to approach their individual class. Mm. Providing PD, but also providing ideas. I think what teachers often lack is they work quite on their own a lot, uh, teachers. So they, they, they might be doing their research or they're doing their instruction. It's a very lonely task. They might go to a conference a few times a year or meet with colleagues directly to, to share ideas and so forth. But by and large, they're on their own. So providing this PD for opportunities to exhibit and model different ways of doing things is a good thing mm. for them. And then hope some of them come along. One of the areas I'm particularly interested in thinking through is, is the extent to which um, we're, we're heavily invested in the high, in the learning and outcomes-based learning systems. And I think it's valid and appropriate, but not consistently and all the time and for everything. So to what extent can students even define their own outcomes and then work towards it? That would be a problem-solving activity for a student in, like, let's say, a second semester, a second term course of, let's say, year two, when they've mm -hmm. got an institution. Or in adult learning, but they're adults. They probably have work experience. By and large, they've got work experience, so they're working right now. Why not build a system where they come in and say, you know what I want to know is X, Y, and Z. And so you work with them, consult with them to define the outcomes they want to achieve and provide the material that leads to that effect. That's the ultimate goal of outcomes-based education. Mm -hmm. But actually, the way it's implemented, by and large, is a way of organizing curriculum. It's not about organizing learning or it's not the student centers it claims to be in many cases. Exactly. It is standardized uh, uh, pathways versus what you're talking about, if I may paraphrase them as personalized learning pathways, personalized, right? It's not It's not the baby in the bathwater. It's not that standardization and outcome, like uh, um, outcomes-based learning is the enemy. It's... Oh. How come we can't have outcomes-based learning that is co-created in a collaborative way with individual students? And then this is where I feel we always get therein, as Shakespeare would say, lies the rub in, in that we, whenever I have conversations like this about ideas that have a strong evidence-based rationale to them around high quality teaching and learning experiences, whether they be um, for adults, for undergrads, we come up against structural constraints because even if we want to take personalization of assessment, right? AI, everyone's freaked out about AI. We're looking at the technology. I think it's because we have overly depended on outcomes-based uh, performative tasks and assessment throughout these large enrollment Courses, right? You only have a certain amount of time with students. You don't. You're not going to be able to do these kinds of quote unquote authentic assessment measures, projects, presentations, discussions, things of that nature with 200, even 60, or you know, one instructor with 60 or 75 students. That becomes unrealistic and unfeasible. So until so we have these conversations and we get we talk to instructors, right? And we say, hey, here's a PD session. Learn about this really interesting thing that you could do in your course. And then the structural constraints, yeah, yeah, demoralize the implementation, the operationalization. So, is it because you're talking about these two levels, structural systematic changes and these microcosmic um, classroom, whether those be in person or online classroom experience changes? Would it be fair to say these have to be happening together, or is it your opinion that kind of the structural ones? We have to accept that those exist and not necessarily worry about changing them and figure out what we can do on the ground. I think in education, it comes down to the individual instructor teaching that course content that's, you know, considered important for the field area that they're going into. And I think it's the individual instructor who's going to, by and large, be the one who operationalizes that. So they have to be on board. But, it, but it's about trade-offs. Everything in life, is a tra there are trade-offs in it, right? So it's, where are the trade-offs? I think the system of education that it stands works to a large degree because we have large populations who need a lot of education to do the kind of jobs coming through in the future, even more than ever before. 
the rapid change of technology is going to, we know that even AI itself, and this is one of the big fears, that it's going to radically change the types of jobs people will do. So you need education to get people to that point. So having a large scale system has val validity in that context. But where are the trade-offs down the line? It seems to me that on a micro scale within a unit or a department, and certainly in continuing studies, is, is, a, is a field that has fewer of those structural constraints. You can experiment in different ways. And you're also not dealing with like, you know, if you were talking about this in K to 12, it becomes extremely political. Yeah. And for good reason, right? Because it's people's children uh, that you're experimenting with. You can't, it, it's, you have to have really good research behind what you're going to be doing in that area. But with adult learning, it enables some kind of level of experimentation about that and how an individual instructor or a group of instructors, like a community of practice, gets together to think through those types of things and then implement them, see how they go. I think that I think the system sometimes doesn't provide the uh, it argues that it provides the freedom to do that, but I think the time structures and time mm -hmm. time sensitivities reduce it somewhat. That's just part one of this exciting conversation, my friends. Click on part two and continue with us on this important journey we like to call the education revolution. <laughs>